Well, good morning. I'm Mark Cancy, and I'm a senior advisor here at CSIS, and it's my pleasure to welcome you both here in person and online uh, to our event this morning. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Admiral Dave Oliver um, and uh, Anand Toprani uh, coming here to speak about American defense reform. Before we get into that, though, I required to make an announcement that in the unlikely event of an emergency, uh, I will provide instructions about what to do. We will either exit the building from the front or the back. Uh, we're, uh, as I noted, uh, pleased to have um, <clears throat> our speakers here today. Admiral Oliver, of course, has a very long and distinguished uh, career in the U.S. Navy uh, and in the Department of Defense. He was a submariner, uh, commanded uh, submarines and submarine squadrons uh, in the Pacific. Uh, in uh, the Pentagon, he ran acquisition programs and was deeply involved uh, in Navy strategic planning. Uh, Anand uh, graduated from Cornell, Oxford, and Georgetown, uh, and he served with uh, CENTCOM uh, J2, uh, has written about uh, oil policy in the Middle East and is a uh, professor at the Naval War College. Uh, they have together written a book on defense reform, and here's the book. The book assesses um, DOD management through the experience of the U.S. Navy, looking at different phases in Navy history post-war, and looking at their both successes and their failures to see what you know, has worked, what uh, hasn't worked, and brings those uh, uh, experiences you know, to the fore to talk about you know, what we can learn for the future. So with that as an introduction, let me turn the floor over to Admiral Oliver uh, and your discussion and your slides. Anna and I were, uh, a couple of years ago, we were up at Naval War College working on another project. And, and what we decided we were both concerned about was that as shown in the slide, which is a shifting threat, where you, you have the Crimea and, and Ukraine and other issues, and you have all the issues around the South China Sea, but you can see the world threat shifting with GDP to what to China, and you can also see it shifting to uh, environmental concerns. Each Secretary of Defense that I have known comes in terribly concerned about what is he going to do with change. Because the Secretaries of Defense realize, I mean, everyone that's a player, it has a bigger picture and recognizes that national defense has to change or become static and, and not nearly as capable. Um, the problem with that, is, and this basically is, I'm going to tell you what we're going to say and then we're going to say it, is that you have these problems, but, but what the military is inherently conservative, and we're going to talk about this, the military resists change. No matter how much the secretary may want to lead it, they resist it. And secretaries sometimes uh, then result to what are suboptimal ways of inducing change. And I'll give you an example. Let's say Secretary Gates decides what military programs to buy. And once he's decided that, or which wants to kill, he turns to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and says, what do you think, Mike? Well, guess who in our country is composed of guys who have spent 40 years of their lives learning about various military things? It's not Secretary Gates. And so, you have to involve the military before you make those decisions or you're, you're really working on a suboptimal. So what we, but, but the military itself really is resistant. And the second thing it comes down to uh, is that what the people you don't notice in your day-to-day -day life is what's changing. For example, I was once talking at Wharton with the guy who was in charge of the Defense Logistics Agency who was giving a speech about how he'd reduced delivery of spare parts 
from 100 days down to 48. And I said, it's really great because Caterpillar has knocked it from two days down to 18 hours worldwide. And so it'll be interesting when you get down to single digits, right? I mean, but the rest of the world is missing that that whole thing is happening and how should they adjust? Should, I mean, because there are adjustments that can be made. Maybe you need to worry, still worry about the last mile, et cetera. Um, the key to this we talked about is how does the Secretary of Defense, as somebody of the President, will work, how do you develop a consensus or development of view which looks at both the future and looks at what I have now uh, to make decisions in which you get the full uh, benefit of, of the civilians and military, et cetera. And there are other players, right? There's Congress, there's an industrial base. Uh, and so in our book, what we're going, what we did is we looked at this historically as Anand's going to talk about, and then we looked at those other players and said, what are the best practices? So uh, when we talk about problems with, mil with military innovation, I want to be very clear about one thing. This is not something that's specific to the US military, and it's not something specific to our contemporary sort of period in time. You know, my value, I hope, as an historian is to show the context in which all of these events occur. And a close study of military history reveals that all militaries in the modern age have problems with innovation. The question is, why don't they innovate even when there are new technologies that afford you a potential, uh, the, the ability to potentially transform warfare? And it can happen for a variety of reasons, and we talk about it at great length in our book, and I don't want to belabor it here. But generally what you're going to find is good ideas, to echo a point Andy Marshall of that assessment once made, good ideas don't speak for themselves. If you're going to properly exploit a new military technology, you have to integrate it within a military service. And that problem of integration is really difficult if it either conflicts with a, with a military's prevailing service culture or the prevailing social culture in which a, in which a military operates. You know, we mentioned Blitzkrieg. The problem with Blitzkrieg is not that countries don't have tanks or wireless radios or close support aircraft. It's that only one country has the requisite military culture and political culture, Germany, to take advantage of Blitzkrieg in 1939. Sometimes, uh, in the case of, say, remotely piloted vehicles, the use of unmanned aircraft to perform certain vital military functions is something that contradicts a prevailing service culture, that of the Air Force and to a certain extent uh, that of the Navy, which privileges the role of manned aircraft. The idea that there are certain things that require a man, in, a man or woman in the cockpit, otherwise in a sense it contradicts the values and the ethos of that service. And even more extraordinarily, sometimes the service will adopt a new technology, in the case of nuclear-powered submarines, but it causes immense friction within that service. So nuclear, nuclear submariners within the nuclear power community understood that this new technology had fundamentally transformed warfare, but the rest of the Navy was unwilling to accept the ramifications of what this meant, so that even within a service, the submarine community and the rest of the Navy, in a sense, went in two different directions. So again, the problem of innovation and adaptation is real. It is a general widespread problem, and it, and it shows the necessity for strong leadership in order to overcome the military's sometimes justified, sometimes unjustified reluctance to change how it does business. It's fine. What, what these next couple of slides are going to talk about is uh, when we think about Defense, national defense is involved with lots of people, lots of military, uh, commerce is involved, state certainly involved. But the key people, when we think about it in this town, is, is the Defense Department, uh, state, the Congress, and the state, the, uh, the Defense Department, and Congress, and the industrial base. And what we're going to do is talk about why those three have difficulty, why th those three have difficulty making change by themselves. First of all, in, unless you have been a political appointee yourself, you do not realize how limited the numbers are. Right, Josh? I mean, it's just astounding. Even if the Senate agrees, the president only gets 400 political appointees that, that go to the Department of Defense. 
There are 60 that required Senate confirmation, of which I don't even know how many there are right now that have been confirmed. And there are 120 non-career SESs, and then you end up with 250 people who are often secretaries, or they fill individual jobs. Since I had a guy working with me who, who did Russia policy, uh, Russia trade for me. But in a, in a service, for example, in a, uh, a Navy might have three people who are confirmed and uh, six or seven uh, SESs. On the other side, unless you learn how to power it, you have 900 generals and admirals who have spent their life trying to learn about things. You have 10,000 06s and above, all of whom are significant managers. And yes, 700 career SESs. So that's 400, when those 400 go into the Pentagon the day after the president comes in, there were 25,000 people there before, there are 25,000 people the day afterwards. And those 400 do not make a ripple unless they understand how to work with the Defense Department itself, with the military. Congress, Congress in our opinion, has deliberately reduced their role. They have taken, they have decided, to much extent they've decided they're not interested in defense. When Newt Gingrich was there in 1995, he reduced his staff 30%. Before that, you had really valuable people. You had the staffers who had been there for a long time who understood defense. You, talk, you had senators and congressmen who focused on the general issue of defense. There are exceptions now, for example, Senator Reid, but there are not many people who, are not, who have walked away from that to focus only on what, how it affects their districts. And if we, when we did, we did a review of the, the staffers in Washington, and uh, as you can see, 25 to 50% of the people who were staffers in a staff, let's say a staff of eight, they now have a staff of, of five in Washington, and they sent three people back to the home district to make sure they get erect, elected again. So as a result, and a result of the fact that you've taken the Congressional Research Service and taken it down 40%, you no longer have Congress providing as strong, a value, as valuable an input as they once did. The other part you have to recognize is though we all say that industry is terribly important and industry, I used to be an in industry, and I, you know, I'm certainly gonna make the position that I'm terribly important, but you know what? I don't swear to the allegiance to the same things that people in government swear to. In industry, I'm responsible to the shareholders first, then I'm responsible to the executive team I've assembled and brought in to work this problem, and then I'm responsible to my wife to bring home a bunch of money because the job is not nearly as interesting as it was in government. The point of that is, and we, use, we talk all these things in the book where we talk about, we talk about, for example, that let's say I was talking to the chairman of General Dynamics where we were talking to the Army about something that was in the Army's interest but it required the Army to change, and he just sat there, and I went out to his headquarters and I said, you know that's right. You and I have talked of, uh, that this is important. And he says, yes, but they don't want to do it, and they do my contracts, and I'm not about to threaten $2 of my income over, some, over the principal. You're responsible for running the government. We're not. You have to understand that's really what industry's doing. And there's the other problem we talk about in the book, the, the, the threat, to, uh, the challenge to us all, is where is innovation coming from? Innovation is coming from bright people who get the money to put this, uh, their ideas together. But if you look at it, the world market is $84 trillion, from which this money is being generated. There's only $21 trillion in the U.S., and the defense base is $0.7 trillion and it is much more focused on things only with the military, it's, it's not doing software research and computer research and all the top end stuff that makes most of that trade in the world possible. So how do you deal with this? 
So we've just spent the last few slides talking to you about how complex a defense problem is and how it defies the ability of any one person or even a small group of really well-intentioned people to master it. But that poses an analytical problem for us. How are we supposed to get our arms around the problem so that we can offer what we hope would be useful guidance or useful su for su suggestions for, for moving forward? And the best way was to create a, an analytical framework we could get our arms around. And the way to do that was to study the Navy. And there's two reasons we studied the Navy. First reason is I'm very lazy. I work for the Navy. I know the Navy. I might as well study it because they sign my paychecks. But the second and perhaps more substantive reason is uh, a Navy officer once, once joked that if you wanted to promote jointness in Washington to get the services to play better with one another, the trick was to abolish the Army and the Air Force and to rename the U.S. Navy the U.S. military because it already has its own army. I think Mark knows a little bit about the Marines. And it already has its own Air Force. It's called Naval Aviation. So the Navy is a subset of our defense, uh, of our defense enterprise, but it's a subset that actually deals with, that operates in all the major domains of war, and it's a way in which you can sort of structure the problem in a manageable way and perhaps generalize, you know, make useful sort of generalizations on the basis of this one sort of narrow, uh, narrow example. And so we looked at the history of the Navy during a set of three fiscal challenges following the Second World War, and we were trying to understand why did the Navy adapt well under certain circumstances, and why did it adapt poorly? And were there lessons we could draw from this particular experience? Now, again, we go into all of this in great detail in our book, and I don't want to sort of belabor this point. A little bit of background for each of these crises. In the, after the Second World War, obviously, you have the challenge of demobilization, going from an economy where roughly 90% of federal spending is devoted to national defense, about 30 to 40% of GDP. You've got to slash that budget by 90% plus while still maintaining the world's largest and most powerful uh, uh, military to sort of uphold the, the post-war international order. After Vietnam, the decline in spending is not as great as it was after World War II, but the problems are, in a sense, more insidious because, uh, because of the Johnson administration's decisions about how it was going to wage war in Vietnam. It had hidden the true cost of the war from the American people to maintain support for its domestic agenda which meant the budget had not increased sufficiently to account for the fact that you were waging sustained high-end sort of combat operations uh, in Indochina. And as a result of this, the military by the end of the Vietnam War has to a certain extent been hollowed out in the sense that you had used up a tremendous amount of your physical and human capital over the course of this war. And at the end of the pro uh, war, you need to recapitalize this force. But you face two major uh, constraints. One is pervasive anti-war sentiment, which limits your ability to raise the budget. And the second and most, I would say, most difficult problem is the problem of inflation, which means that combined with uh, anti-war sentiment, you're never really able to sort of recapitalize your force and pay for modernization. So you have to make tough choices about what's really important to this force moving forward. And then finally, after the Cold War, you face immense demands to sort of deliver to American people, one, a peace dividend, uh, to sort of make up for all the sacrifices they had endured during the Cold War. But you also need to have a force that can serve as a foundation for the United States uh, to sort of build up in the event that 20 or 30 years down the line, a great power competitor arises where none had existed in the 1990s. That might not be the same thing, say, in 2020. So again, I'm not going to go through each of these case studies in any, in any particular detail, but I will say, in the 1940s, the Truman administration was desperate to cut defense spending. And it was looking for any sort of excuse it could, uh, any sort of rationale that could sort of promise you an effective defense at the lowest possible cost. And at this particular point in time, the Air Force comes up with a very compelling political narrative, a narrative of how the Air Force will use American technology, combined with, which is to say, the atomic bomb, and long-range sort of four-engine uh, bomber aircraft to wage strategic bombing campaigns against any potential rival. And that this is how, in a sense, America can maintain a credible defensive and deterrent posture after World War II at the lowest political cost. As a result, the Secretary of Defense makes a decision to cancel the Navy's first supercarrier, which provokes the famous revolt of the admirals, which I'm not going to get into so much. The long and short of it is, is that there are profound dangers 
for political leaders in listening to advice that is politically convenient. And on occasion, that politically convenient advice might in fact come from the military services, who are actually not, as whatever one might think, who are not disinterested observers to the entire process of who gets what in terms of the defense budget. In the 1960s, as a sort of precursor to the problems that you face uh, in the 1970s after Vietnam, in the 1960s, the Navy faces the other great challenge to sort of its, its mission and its, and its raison d'etre. And that comes from McNamara, Robert Strange McNamara, who is probably one of the most remarkable Americans of the 20th century. And we only talk about a small portion of what he did in that remarkable life. But in terms of defense, the most important thing he did was to apply the principles of microeconomics to how we would adjudicate uh, competing demands for limited shares of defense dollars. And we did this through the application of what is known as systems analysis. Systems analysis is basically two concepts. One, you understand the cost of a, of a particular weapon system not in isolation, but only as a part of a system. An aircraft carrier doesn't operate except as a part of a system. You need to have planes on it, you need to have ships to protect it, you need to have infrastructure to support it. How else do you understand the full cost of what you're buying unless you understand the entire system that supports it? And the second point is, when you have competing ideas about how to satisfy a national objective, say the Navy has one gadget and the Air Force has, has the same gadget, the way you adjudicate this is through the use of quantitative measures of microeconomics of marginal utility in that which program will give you for every additional dollar you spend the most effective or, or, the, or the most efficient sort of increase in capabilities. But this is a quantitative measure that economists are using, and it runs head first into the military sort of preference for professional military advice, which by its very nature is both anecdotal and qualitative and leads to a profound friction with people between people who are all well-intentioned but see the world in very different ways and use very different ways of talking about the political choices that they're making. And this all comes to a head over a fighter plane that no one knows about uh, today, but is basically the F-35 of its day. McNamara's view is if the Navy and the aircraft and the Navy and the Air Force need the same plane, why do they develop the plane independently? Why not have the same, uh, have developed the same plane and simply you know, modify it for both services to use. You'll save all sorts of money in terms of overhead. The problem arises is that who is going to lead development of that program? Will the Air Force, in a sense, lead development and create a plane that's suited for Air Force needs and force it on the Navy, or will the Navy take leadership and force a Navy plane on the Air Force? And it turns out that McNamara has already annoyed the Air Force to no end by canceling its useless strategic bomber. He makes a political decision to allow the Air Force to take program management over the F-111 fighter, which ends up creating a, a plane that the Navy cannot use. And the Navy goes, in a sense, to war with the Secretary of Defense again, and it loses. And, and CNO uh, George Anderson gets a, an extended visit, uh, extended stay in Portugal as a result. His successor is a man who is determined to avoid his mistakes. And he does so by basically saying that he will bow to political pressure uh, and, political, uh, and political preferences in order to, to satisfy the Navy's key equities. And the CNO in question was David McDonald. And as an aviator, he only cared about one thing, and that was aircraft carriers. He wanted more aircraft carriers, and he wanted to make certain that they were nuclear powered. The way he did this was by giving into McNamara on every other major issue. And if any of you ever read H.R. McMaster's book, Dereliction of Duty, you'll know that the main thing he advocated moral responsibility for was complaining about how the Vietnam War was being conducted. And so McDonald succeeded. He got the aircraft carriers he wanted, but he did not do anything about the budgetary issues that were hollowing out the Navy and basically crippling its ability to serve as a, as a credible sort of post-war a uh, force that could uphold American interests around the world. And it fell to one of his successors, Elmo Zumwalt, to fix the mess that McDonald had created. So you essentially have the first time, which is after the Korean, after the World War II, the Navy had to, do, had to adjust. Had to, yeah. After World War II, the Navy had to adjust. And when it did so, it did not do it very well. Right? So you ended up with the revolt of the Admirals became the route of the admirals, and, and there's a lot of uh, non-constructive effort that went on in the Navy at that point. You get to Zumwalt, and 
Jim Wolf came in essentially after the next CNO, after McDonald, the next CNO was very short. And Jim Wolf came in and he has all the problems that Anna was talking about. The biggest problem he has is if, for a Navy to survive is based on the concept that 29% of the people were Arianists. And this drives how many people you have to recruit, how many people you have to train, all sorts of things. But you have to, most people don't realize that that's what the Navy was designed on at that time. When Zoom Oil took over, you had 9% of the people were enlisting. Why were they re-enlisting? Because there were race riots in the carriers, there were race riots in the Marine Corps too, there were race riots uh, on the cruisers. The people, the, the conditions were so deplorable aboard ship because no money had been invested in them. You just cannot believe how awful it was to live aboard a ship. And so the guys were leaving. So they were voting with their feet as to what they thought. And they we came into a re-enlistment rate at 9%. Zumwalt, we talked something about it in the book. Zumwalt did some extraordinary things to turn that around. He basically had two different new surface ships commissioned uh, in record time. And he, he launched a big program to solve uh, integration and to encourage women, all of which was resisted by the Congress, which was all Southern domi dominated with respect to the congressional committees, and President Nixon who said, you could maybe be able to do something about the blacks, but don't you do anything about the women. So, you know, there were some problems he faced. He was very successful, and I was part of his personal study. However, as soon as he left, the Navy went full speed to reverse, and getting rid of all those things. So while he may have been personally successful, organizationally he was not because he didn't include this widespread group. He really had these things done by 21 people who were very close to him and his staff. But he didn't get the Navy involved and he didn't get rid of them. So what happens in the post-Cold War is when in 1990, and Admiral Kelso was CNO. What Kelso did was said, okay, I'm gonna have the 29, 29 admirals and generals that, that, that cover all the Marine Corps and the Navy. I'm gonna have them meet for 18 months, every morning, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, at 5.30 in the morning so nobody can complain about the fact they have a appointment with somebody from the Hill, and they're going to get together, and they're actually going to discuss with no one else around, nobody taking notes, no minutes kept, no juniors in the room. We actually had somebody from the Appropriations Committee and the Authorization Committee there. And we're going to talk about all of these issues so that the guys understand, because the aviators don't understand what submarines can do or what service warfare. And, and the Marines don't understand, and the Navy didn't understand, and Navy admirals don't understand what Marines are doing. So we took 18 months to explain this in a flag officer level. In addition to which, we got these outside briefs from, from guys like uh, Dov, Dov Zakheim, who would later on become important in a different administration. We employed people like that, and all of them were the same kind of intellects to come in and brief us what they thought was going to happen for the next two decades and why. And did a bunch of research. By the end of that time, what, when Kelso went down to the secretary, he said, he said, look, I want to get rid of our stealth airplane. Right? We're not going to do stealth because we don't need stealth against the Soviet Union and we don't need to do long range strike because the Air Force is already doing it and besides that you can do it better with missiles today. So I'm, I'm taking a, a long-range stealth airplane, and we are trashing it, and we are going to buy a short-range plane we can afford. We're going to take the submarine that the Congress has already approved building and approved building 23 of them, cost $3 billion, piece. we're going to trash it. We're going to build the first three, we'll redesign them for something else, but we don't want a $3 billion submarine. We don't have much invested in submarines, even though they were perfectly they helped in the Cold War. We're not facing the Soviet Union anymore. So I want to take this money and put it in other places. Like we put it into SEALs and stuff like that. At the same time, 
aviation, we had 787 airplanes aboard the, the carriers and the airwings. We had 20,000 lying in reserve in case we started losing these 787. Each of those 20,000 cost $10 million a year to keep up. So we threw them away. And because an aircraft, aircraft production had changed at certain time. And we said, we're going to take the Navy and Marine Corps and force them together and throw away our old bases. So we take, for example, in Tustin, the airplane Tustin, where the Marines were flying in their approach, would fly, each Marine would fly over three, school, three schools and an orphanage before they got to the landing center. We said, we're going to move them out of there, give them the Navy's best base, which is a Miramar, move the, which now you have the helicopters next to the ships, and now we take the Navy, which had flies long range aircraft, move about in the desert. All that, if, if you think that any one of the people who was sporting, who was in charge of air or submarine inventing, liked all that stuff, they would have never made the choice to begin. But once they understood the common picture of what was happening with the country and what was happening with defense, we got what, what Bezos refers to, what's he called, his consensus, where the guy who agrees he may be crazy, but they agree to go along with it. We developed that. The point of it is, is you could do that, uh, you can, and what we're going to say is, you could do, the secretary could do that if he doesn't. What, but the important, rather than point out how successful the Navy was, which involved a bunch of other slides, what happened in the Air Force and Army where they refused to do anything then when the Cold War was over? The Air Force continued building their stealth F-22. They put so much money into it that in the 90s, there were four years in which they couldn't buy any airplane, tactical airplane. Couldn't buy F-15s, couldn't buy F-16s. Because they couldn't afford anything other than the F-22 and the B-2, right? The Army kept building a uh, putting funding billions of dollars into Comanche, which was a failed concept, it was a stealth helicopter, by the way, and a failed concept, and when, and finally it took until Rumsfeld canceled it, the same thing with Crusader, which was another failed concept. But the guys kept putting billion dollars in, and both those were, were weapons that only be used against the Soviet Union. If you thought about it, you would have 17 years of investments of billions of dollars into other capabilities, so when 9-11 ha happens, you are a completely different military. What we are saying in our book is that when we looked at it, we saw where the Navy made mistakes following World War II, where Zumwalt tried different things, and then Kelso redefined the process. That process is the best process we've seen. And there's lessons learned that goes with it for the Secretary of Defense to use, which is a, involves bringing the four stars in, and making and developing the consensus of, of what the world's going to be. That can be done, and it's what can drive, can drive real uh, rebalancing and reshaping when it becomes necessary, when the president decides it becomes necessary. That's our summary, which essentially says what I just said. And uh, that's our book. We, we wrote it because we thought somebody ought to document what the best practices were in this area, because it's so important. And, and it's sometime soon, if you think about it, the people tell us that the budget really hasn't changed since 9-11. <coughs> Congress is frozen in fear that if they change the budget to send over, people will say they're weak on defense. And so the, how much you have Air Force, Navy, Army, how much is going into various areas of strike as opposed to intelligence, essentially been frozen. When does the secretary rebalance it? It's going to happen sometime. And how does he do it? Well, thanks a lot. I have a couple of questions as a moderator, and then we'll um, give uh, people in the audience, both at present and online, a chance to ask their own questions. <clears throat> but my first question is about this uh, notion that you have uh, articulated that it's process, not personality. And my question then is, what about Secretary Lehman, who was you know, such a huge personality, um, you know, maybe along with NHTSA, you know, the you know, major 
um, you know, uh, uh, Secretary of the Navy who you know, really had an impact. You know, how, how do you think about what he did and the impact he had on the Navy with this notion about process rather than personality? Adam, his, his next book is on Secretary Lehman. Uh, we've had some long discussion. In my last book, I talked about this specific problem, which is that what people don't recognize is a lot that what was said was going on was not really going on. For example, uh, the, what was called the maritime strategy, which is a concept of sending the U.S. Uh, carrier forces and the Marines forward immediately to go against the Soviet Union as opposed to our previous war plan was to uh, spend 30 days with having the submarines count. And I recognize we had 67 nuclear submarines. The Soviet Union had 320 total submarines. We, our submarines were better. What we we're going to do is send them forward and, and have a big muck out and try to reduce that threat before we sent the carriers and the ARG for it. Maritime strategy, which was done by a CNO and then picked up by Secretary Lehman, said, no, you can do that right away. Uh, it, it, and what, what you do not appreciate, and I don't think you do, and I, and, I, and I don't think there's anybody in the audience does, is if they look at it historically, about 1985, the CNOs quit talking about that and dropped it completely. And the reason was, his sink pack fleet, who was Bob Foley, had called me up and said, you're telling me all the time nobody, that submarines can kill everybody. But the maritime strategy, I just got a new war plan that tells me to push forward. I want to do an exercise at sea, documented with observers everywhere, and what do you say? And I said, give me five submarines and I'll sink the entire Pacific fleet. Because I was, uh, this is before I became the the moderated person I am today. And he gave me seven. And then we went through a big exercise in which his three-star commander, fleet commanders were in charge of each aspect. And we did a 21-day exercise. And then the results were sent back. Bob Foley called the Secretary of Defense and said, you have to change the war plan. And I, and I came back with somebody else and we briefed it. And we changed the war plan. Because as a concept as a political concept, maritime strategy may have sounded really neat. As a war fighting concept, it was crazy. Okay, tell me how you really feel about the, the war plan. <laughs> I, I think just to Go ahead. briefly follow on to what David's saying. I mean, we're not making an argument that civilian leaders should just simply abdicate their responsibility and leave national defense to the quote unquote experts. Because the military are experts on certain things, and they might not be experts on other things. There's no, there's no clear division where, where expertise lies within the realm of national defense. One could say that in terms of, say, war fighting, that's something or the military probably has a, uh, has a, a, a knowledge sort of uh, advantage over, over civilian leaders. The point is not that civilian leaders shouldn't have the power to direct, but maybe they should use, just because they have the statutory power to direct, doesn't mean they should direct in matters in which they don't have the competency to. And this is something where, in a sense, we're, we're just simply trying to make an argument that both sides should seek to leverage each other's strengths and, uh, and recognize each other's weaknesses. And someone like Lehman, I think, you could make the argument, and I think he would make the argument, that he took the position that not only should he provide guidance, but he should direct uh, things when he felt that the military was not, in a sense, uh, fulfilling what, you know, what his desires or what the administration's desires would be. And that potentially could lead you astray if you ended up directing changes in areas where you didn't have sufficient knowledge basis to make an informed decision. In other words, Secretary of Navy is not, Secretary, Secretary of Navy has no responsibility for war fighting, right? He goes to the Secretary of Defense, bypasses the service chiefs, and goes out to whatever they're called at whatever this time at the time they were not combatant commanders, but they were a fleet. <coughs> Secretary of Navy wasn't involved in any of that. Well, let me ask a follow-on question, because this issue of civil-military relations you know, permeates 
the book and the discussion between the civil side and the military side, of course, is fundamental to many of these uh, case studies. Where do you think we are today? You know, there had been, particularly many of the people who are now civilians in the uh, Pentagon had criticized that balancing that had been um, uh, leaning too heavily towards the military under Trump uh, and that they were going to move it back to give civilians more uh, authority. And so where do you think, where do you see that uh, balance today? I don't know because I, I live in California and I think to be, you have to be involved. The interesting part though is various people have done, for example, uh, Secretary Rumsfeld did it with a blizzard of white notes for all of us who were involved that sort of time. For, uh, Secretary Gates did it by making central decisions and then promulgating the military. All of these individuals, Bill Cohen did it a different way. Each of these individuals, you have to recognize, I think you have to recognize that secretaries of defense are important individuals with great skills. What we're advocating is the is that uh, when it becomes time to make a major change or major thought process, you have to involve the military services. Involve, and even though it's unpleasant, because there are a whole bunch of the four stars who will make the life unpleasant, because they are, they are strong personalities, or they wouldn't have gotten there. You have to do that, or else you're not fulfilling, you're not, you're not getting the best results. And, and if I could just sort of tack on to what Dave is saying is that I'm just a scholar. I've never held exalted office. I probably never will hold exalted office. But I will say that this issue that we've talked about, about civil-military relations, theoretically, and I'm going to annoy every political scientist who's watching right now, the theoretical study of civil-military relations is useless because it's only concerned about civilian control over the military in terms of combat. It has almost nothing to say about the actual process of managing defense because that's really what the Pentagon is there to do. It is there to provide forces for consumers out in the field to use. That is the quote unquote business of defense and there are no studies, no theoretical frameworks that'll, that'll help you understand how you manage a day to day enterprise. You know, it's not normal theory, it's not unequal dialogue, none of that matters when you're making these kinds of decisions. It's all about in a sense creating a, a relationship of mutual trust and respect where everyone's voices are heard and that you are able in a sense to reach, in a, to reach the most satisfactory sort of outcome in terms of, or the most efficient outcomes in terms of satisfying long-term national objectives. I just don't think theory is going to be much use in terms of tackling that sort of mundane day-to-day -day sort of relationship. There are all places, sorts of places where military officers are really deficient. Let's talk about the concept of applying capital and of concepts of what's going, what's going on in various worlds that are external to the and, and the relationship with Congress. I mean, all of that is brought in by a civilian, but they, but they must work together. The, the point of this is to work together, vice working against each other. Many secretaries of defense, whom I've known, became frustrated by the fact they couldn't move the military where they wanted to. And what we're trying to show is you can. You just have to go about it in a way that's, that's smart. Great. Well, I have many more questions, but I will not monopolize uh, the floor here. Uh, we do have a uh, microphone if there are uh, people here um, who would like to ask questions. Steve, do, do you, uh, I, I think you're going to have to go up to the microphone over there. We're on a first name basis with all of our participants here. Hello. Hello, Dave. Hi, Steve. Um, how well or not do you think uh, good choices about the, the, the topics that your book addresses have been served by jointness? Um, let me just leave it at that. We all know what we're talking about. Is, is that, uh, maybe I'll, I'll confess my bias, which is I think, I think we've gone over the bend of the curve on, on, on jointness, and it's no longer uh, serving us as, as well as it might. And there's a process piece to which you might speak to, and then a substance or outcomes piece to which you might speak to. I'm not sure. One of the, one of the problems which we talk about in our book that defense organizations have difficulty in changing is because by the time, let's say, you're an admiral, 
you've spent 40 years learning how to work with the tools that you know about and, and with, the pol with, the, with the policy and with the strategy. And you really worked your tail off trying to learn how to do that well. And that's why it really becomes hard when somebody says, you know this tool that you've got over here that you really know how to work really well. You re we really need to devolve that so we have money to invest in this new concept, which you're really not sure is gonna work out. I mean, guys, I mean, we're n we don't know what's gonna work out. That's the reason admirals and generals really have trouble letting loose of stuff. Because they know how to work it and they know what where it's going to kill them, and where it, you can't take shortcuts with it, and they're, you know, and they're, they're not, and they have they have really spent a whole bunch of time, but they're like the monkey with his hand in the cookie jar, right? You've got to let go, and let some of that stuff go. I mean, that's what Kelso did in uh, 1990, that was so impressive, right? He let go a stealth airplane, long range stealth airplane. He let go of the submarine that they were making that would do, have the same strike capability as a carrier. He let go of 20 dozen. I mean, this, uh, by the way, he, he, just, he just decimated every part of his, the Navy, right? He, he took out things that every part of his Navy disagreed with to change the new world. How do you get that? What we're really saying is how do you get that consensus? And the point of it is a jointness. I am always, I'm always astounded by how you spend 40 years one in one, one part, it's really hard to appreciate. What you're talking about with joining us is appreciation of what the other guy does or understanding what he does. Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, I think that's always, that's always gonna be important and really what we're talking about with respect to this is how do we get jointness at the four star level with the Secretary of Defense in looking at everything. At the same time, it wavers up and down with respect to what the real value is because the value to a guy who's, ten, who's got 10 years in service and is immersed in his community uh, with respect to jointness, I'm not sure. I mean, that's not what he's working on right now. I mean, I would say that jointness is generally two things. It's, it's an idea of uh, centralizing. It, it, it's come to mean two things. One is centralizing power in order to sort of overcome inter-service uh, rivalries. And, it, and, and since Goldwater Nichols, that's been about sort of empowering unified combatant commanders. It's fair to say that maybe that's gone about as far as it can go, and you can't really sort of get better results through centralization. But as a, as a professor in, the, in professional military education, I'll say the other aspect of jointness, which actually hasn't gone far enough, is the simple idea about getting people from other services to spend time with one another, to actually understand what other people in different services do. And one of the most extraordinary things I learned about the Navy when I got there is, no Navy officer, junior Navy officer, understands what the Navy does. They understand what their community does, but they don't understand what the rest of the Navy does. And they actually have to have Navy boot camp for people in, in advanced tactical programs so that aviators can learn what submariners can do, can learn what SWOs can do. Do you think any of them know what an Air Force officer does, or what an Army officer does? And in that respect, jointness still actually has a long way to go, but it's not something that's going to be solved by a legislative fix. It's going to be about encouraging the services to send good people to spend time in places where they will interact with other people and learn about this wider project that they're all engaged in. And I don't think we've made enough progress in, in, in that realm. Great. Well, we have a question from online. Uh, and you, I don't know if you can read it up there, but it says, what are your thoughts with respect to the 1993 bottoms-up review um, conducted by the SECDEF and ult the ultimate fallout from the decisions made from that review specifically with respect to submarines and aircraft carriers? And I will put in a, my personal uh, view, which is from a presentational point of view, the 1993, it was actually bottom-up review, was the best of all of the strategic reviews we've done since then because the documentation at least lays out a strategy and then the programs that fall from the strategy and then a budget that is connected with the programs and the strategy. You can argue about the strategy, you can argue about the programs, but that presentational element you have, we have never seen uh, since then and it is one of the great but frustrations. That wasn't the way it was done. <laughs> it wasn't the way it was done. In fact, in 19, we did 
Kelso did his review in 1990 to 1991. We, gave, we, we went to the president and in, in 1990, we announced we're not gonna do the A-12. In 1991, we announced that we were gonna reduce submarines from where they were to half that number. And, uh, and what I'm saying is the bottom-up review reflected what Kelso had done for the Navy. I, kn I know that I wrote that part, okay? So it looked like it was really reflective, but that's because we'd spent 18 months figuring it out. And so what they did, the fact that, the, for example, the submarines, the submarines we cut in half, I, what it's based on is has based on nothing other than the fact that I wanted to have at least 25 in each fleet so I'd have three squadrons so we could replace guys who were below average. We wouldn't f worry about firing them. And there was, a, there was a number at which I couldn't, if I reduced it to 20 and you only had 10 in each fleet, then everybody would go crazy if you wanted to fire some guy because he's incompetent. If you have 25, it's not so much a deal. So I don't end up with submarines running aground like the one that ran aground in the South China Sea three months ago, right? The fact that the guy ran aground is an admiral's fault for not firing him. But we have enough, you need to have enough in an organization. That's how that was done. And the same thing with respect to aircraft carriers, the concept, if, if you know what happened as we said, you don't have to actually have a full wing to have an aircraft carrier. An aircraft carrier ends up being something that becomes a part of the United States, which can be used by lots of people and lots of things. And so I can reduce the cost, I'll keep the number of platforms, but I'll reduce the cost by reducing the number of air wings that man them and change into air wing construction. Because if I look at it from a big perspective, the dollar value that Anand was talking about earlier on as a system, I can reduce all parts of it without saying I'll take out an aircraft carrier in that chunk. So, so we kept that as a, a portable island, essentially. Let me, let me then ask a question. Um, one area where arguably the Air Force has been ahead of the Navy is in UAVs. You know, they, you know, they were very, they got into it reluctantly. Uh, it took a long time. Uh, it wasn't until really the beginning of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan that you know, they came to embrace uh, um, UAVs and recognizing that now they are maybe stepping back a little, but they're way ahead of the Navy and the Marine Corps. And so my question is, how did that happen? Uh, you know, that is really, if you want to know how it happened. It's a really good question. So if you want to know how it happened, then read our book. Which chapter is it? Chapter 8. Chapter 8. And it'll specifically tell you exactly how it happened and how OSD blackmailed the Air Force and made them do something they didn't want to do. Right. And you can then worry about what's happened since with respect to not having the strict... Because of the history of UAVs is Bill Perry said this is the most important military development we have and I want everybody to become involved in it, right? And then uh, Bob, Bill Cohen put out a memo saying the same thing, the most important thing we have involved is UAVs and I want everybody to reduce it. And the secretaries the, and, the, and the chiefs of staff of the services and the secretaries of services said, right, I got this, we're not putting any of it in our budget. So if you want to know the story about how we went from two secretaries demanding that it be done, using one specific concept of this is what I want done, and nothing being done to the fact that the Air Force had to do it over their dead bodies, you can read our book. Because it essentially is used as an example of how OSD and civilian control can work I'm not sure it's the best for it because it's right now the Air Force is walking away from it. But it's, it's, we very specifically cover that issue. Right. Uh, and the Air Force, I mean, I was in the building at that time, and of course I've read the book. Um, but why hasn't the, and the, 
the Navy, the Air Force was pushed into it, but why hasn't the Navy followed? I mean, the Navy are, arguably is 20 years behind the Air Force here. And the Marine Corps is in the same position. When I do my annual military I forces, I have a chart that shows Air Force, 300 UAVs, armed UAVs, Marine Corps, three. And so what we've said is, the military has really difficulty making change. And what we've implied is, the reason you have civilian administration come in is to guide change, because it's, what else are you doing? And, and the concept is, like a, so maybe the military, uh, the secretaries of defense of, are not fulfilling that side of it, right? When it is, it's the only way you get change. The only way you, re, the only way you rebalance national defense for China and for the environment is with the Secretary of Defense and President deciding to do it. Now, the question, how they do it, we proposed a process. When it happens, I have no idea when it's going to be. We sort of rushed to get this out because we thought it might be after this midterms. I don't know when it's going to happen. At some point, somebody's got to do it. The best way to do it is the process we recommend in our book. Okay, we have, oh, okay. We, we have a question, and this, I think, will be our last one here. Um, how do you get the services to buy into the F-35 program? And maybe my question is, should they? We, we spoke last night to a different group, and General Howell knows us because he, at one time, was the program manager for the F-35. The F-35 program, Joint Strike Fighter program, and this is not well known, I'm, I'm right, I, Bill Perry has a, a copy of a paper I'm writing right now because I th thought, think it has to be documented. What people do not appreciate is Bill Perry in the late 80s, along with some other people, said, what happens if you go to the Paris Air, I don't know how many people in this room have been to Paris Air Show, some have. You go to the Paris Air Show or the, Paris, the Air Show in Berlin or wherever, and what do you see? You see countries trying to sell the, the airplanes they have built. And they're trying to sell them because there's nobody but the U.S. that does a production line long enough to pay for the initial investment. Well, how, how are we doing? We do long production line. So if you're develop, if you are uh, Norway and have developed an airplane, and you really want to do that because you've got a lot of engineers that are high thinking, et cetera, and they can develop airplanes in a high, it's a high prestige thing. So you develop this airplane, and they sell the eight of them to their country that can afford it. Now how many do they have to sell to pay off the production line development? So what happens is, if you go to a Paris Air Show, you say to yourself, how many of these being sold to countries that shouldn't have them or are gonna use them to kill civilians? And they're gonna machine gun the Ugandis as they run across the plane, right? You just, you go to the Paris Air Show and that's the image that comes in your mind. Because you know those airplanes, there's not enough airplanes in the world to fit them, right? How big, the Italian Air Force when I was there was 71. I mean, 71, we wouldn't even sign an 06 in the Air Force to have a 71. You know what I mean? You have to understand. So what we did, what the purpose of the Joint Strike Fighter was to give the allied countries that we trusted a reason to invest in us so they wouldn't be building airplanes that they would then be pressured into selling to places they shouldn't. Because even the best countries get pressurized and sell places they shouldn't. I mean, England just had to, uh, England just got fined $1.7 trillion. Actually, they sold, talked about how they sold $1.7 trillion in arms to people that are against the international rules, right? And if you remember, during the Reagan administration, the reason that Colonel, what's his name, uh, who was North. selling arms, huh? North. No, the Marine. North. Yeah, yeah Ali North. North. The reason Ali North, he was selling, he was selling arms 
to the wrong people, it's completely counter for. If the U.S. and Britain, which are supposedly our, our burning lights of uh, leadership in this area, can be forced by fiscal pressures or other pressures into violating this, how do you avoid it? And what, and what well, Bill Perry was trying to do is said, with the next joint, if we take a, an aircraft and we involve the allies in the design, and we do the, and, and the Marines happen to really need it, and the Air Force really needs it because they don't understand they're not gonna cover the decks, the F-22, and the Navy's gonna have something following, following the uh, F-18. Let's develop, but it was designed from the concept of let's reduce international chaos. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of our hour. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, here's the book again, American Defense Reform, uh, Lessons from uh, Navy Leadership. I recommend it to all of you. Uh, thank you, uh, Admiral Oliver and uh, uh, Professor Troprani to, for joining us. And uh, we hope to uh, continue this conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs>